method and sample size calculation uh, webinar today. Uh, I'm sh okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Mahmoud Danai. I'm from Social and Preventive Medicine Department, Faculty of Medicine. Before I was in EDEC, <laughs> maybe some of you attended to my workshops under EDEC. Uh, today, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, the importance and uh, the methods of the sampling techniques uh, beside the sample size calculation, which is one of the most critical, uh, what do you call it, uh, part in quantitative research design. Okay. Can you see my slide now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So, thank you very much. So, there, as you know better than me, the research is a systematic process of investigation in order to establish the facts. And of course, in order to do that, we need to collect data and analyze the data convert this data to the information, and through this process, we can add to the body of knowledge, right? Um, there are many different types of uh, quantitative research, experimental, survey, existing statistics means meta-analysis and content analysis. Most of these techniques and methods are, uh, what do you call it, can be classified under quantitative research design. Maybe you ask yourself, why the content analysis is, is under quantitative? Because recently, uh, a lot of tech, I mean, because of the progress in some of the uh, computer, uh, what do you call it, uh, science, there are a lot of softwares that convert the content uh, to the numbers. So uh, many softwares now are available and let you to convert your qualitative data, especially for content analysis, to some sort of uh, data. And that's why nowadays the quant content analysis has become a kind of quantitative research because of availability of these softwares and converting the information from the content to the numbers. Uh, of course, in the process of research, collection of empirical data is one of the most important phase, as you know, uh, the including in, in the process of research, we have several steps, right? A step four is sampling and collecting data. That's why any researcher who deal with quantitative research need to know how to do the sampling and how to collect data and how many. This is one of the critical, uh, what do you call it, issues in quantitative research. And maybe you face with some challenges and this is one of the common questions that the uh, examiner will ask from the students. At the same time, if you publish any papers, you need to justify the techniques of the sampling and the sample size calculation. So in today, actually, we try to introduce you some sampling techniques. Uh, beside that, at the end of this workshop, I will teach you how to calculate your adequate sample size. But the question is that, why we need to do the sampling? Can you share your idea? You off your, on your microphone and share your idea. Why do we need to do the sampling? No idea? Why? We uh, can, can, can I talk? Okay. No, please. Yes, 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 please. Yeah, I, I think the sampling, we, we need to, uh, to have a sample size just to represent the population that we include in our study. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, okay, I agree with you, but the question is that, why do we need to do the sampling? Why we don't collect data from the whole, the whole population? We don't have time. <laughs> yes, true. So sometimes there are two main barriers in order to collect data. Ideally, yes. Ideally, if it's possible to collect data from the all population, that will be ideal. That will that will be great. But in the practical manner, it's impossible sometimes to collect data from the whole population because you need more time and also it's costly, right? Suppose that if you need some information about Malaysian people, we know that the population of Malaysia is around 33 million. Is it possible to collect data from the whole population? Yes, <coughs> it's 
sorry. But <clears throat> it needs more time, manpower, and money, right? But the point is that when we collect data from the whole population, the results is 100% accurate. Let me to go to the, okay, so the results will be 100% accurate. So means the results will not be biased. So this is the, this is the point. But we know in the real situation, it's impossible. Sometimes the population is not accessible. You cannot collect data from the whole population. So that's why the solution is the sampling. So we need to go through the sampling. It's low cost and it can be done fast compared to the whole population. But always the results will be biased, correct? So it means the result will not be 100% accurate. So do you know what we call this bias in a statistic? Is this selection bias? Not exactly, yes, selection bias, yeah, but it can be <clears throat> interpreted as selection bias. But how we can measure it? I am sure all of you are familiar with this term, right? Yes. The p-value. What is the p-value? We know only that if p-value is less than 0 0.05, sorry, I'm writing with using mouse, <laughs> a bit difficult. So if less than 0 0.05, we say results are significant. And if it's more, then we say that results are not significant. What does it mean? Significant, this is the threshold, the maximum acceptable bias. Actually, this p-value is the amount of your bias. So if your sample has more bias, then you cannot use those information that you achieve from the sample and inference it to the population. Because at the end of a story, remember, the statistic is the art of collecting data uh, and science, the collecting data from a population through a sample, analysis of data, and finally, we inference and generalize our information from a sample to the population. So if your bias is too high, can I, can I inference my result to the population? Of course, no. So how much is the acceptable level for this bias? It's 5%. So means by 95% confidence above, we can generalize our information from the sample to the population. Correct? And if your bias or p-value is more than 0 0.05, we use the term of not significant. What does it mean? Means we are not allowed to inference or generalize our results from a sample to the population. Let me to give you an example. Suppose that you, com you compare the quality of life among male and female. One study, what, study number one, for the female, we found that the quality of life score is 12, among male is 10.2. And the researcher who did this study calculated the p-value using, for example, t-test, and then this student found the p-value is 0 0.02. Is it significant? Yes. Yeah, here it's significant. So means by 98% confidence, we can claim that in the population, also female has a better quality of life compared to the male. So another study conducted with another, by another researcher, and he found that 12.1 and 11, sorry, I made a mistake. How can I erase it? Erase, I'm sorry. And he found that 8.5. And the p value was 0 0.181. Is it significant? Also, yes. Yes or no? 
No. No, it is not significant, right? So despite the differences between male and female is more than the study number one, but this this is this sam this study has more bias compared to the first study. That's why if you want to influence the results of the population, how much is your confidence? 81%. Right? So you need to understand that what does it mean? The p-value is exactly is the amount of your bias from a sample. So despite the differences is here is much more than the study number one, but the p-value does mean, indicate that these results cannot be in friends to the population. Okay, one more thing that I want to highlight here, because uh, unfortunately I have seen a lot of students that uh, unfortunately, they misuse interpretation of the p-value. The p-value only indicates whether these results can be reproduced, can be repeated or not. If any other, if any other researcher do the same research, will they get the same results or not? When the p-value is a small, it indicates that if you repeat this study again and again and again and again, by 98%, for example, here, by 98% confidence, they will get the same results. So it means this difference is not due to the chance. Okay. Is it clear now? Yes. Okay, so now I'm going to highlight another thing. Suppose that I'm planning to study the socioeconomic status among Malaysian people. I collected 420 questionnaires from my neighborhood area, and I found that the average income, for example, of a Malaysian family is 1.2 million ringgit per month. The average number of property, each family has 7.2, and number of cars in each family is for example, C.1. Can I inference this result to the population? Does it seem to be logic, this information? Are you agreed that each family in Malaysia average income is 1.2 million ringgit per month? No. Okay, but I collected 420 questionnaires. These results uh, achieved based on 420 questionnaire. Why? Why I cannot inference and generalize this result to the population? Because I selected this data only from a limited area. Probably all the people who live here are rich people, right? I cannot inference this result to the population. The set, okay, remember? We can inference our results to the population if my sample is a representative sample. If my sample is not representative, then I cannot, even the p-value does not make sound. So remember, if your sample is not representative sample, can I, do I need to calculate the p-value? What do you think? Do I need, because the p-value, we use it for measuring the bias and later in France and generalizing your result to the population, right? When the sample is not a representative, do I need to calculate the sampling bias? No. That's all. So when we talk about representative sample, means all subjects should have equal chance to be selected, right? It's, it should be a random sample. I will talk about it later. But you need to understand that if the sample is not representative, please do not calculate the p-value. What does it mean? It means we don't need to do a statistical analysis in order to calculate the p-value. We have some non-probable sampling, non-random sampling. Non-random sample are not representative. So actually when your sample is non-random, 
you don't need to calculate, you are not able to calculate the sampling bias, the sampling error. And we know that the p-value reflects the sampling bias or sampling error. And this is a common mistake, unfortunately, among many researchers. They do non-random sample, and then finally they analyze data, and then they judge their results based on p-value. This is totally wrong. Because the p-value shows amount, the amount of bias or your confidence to generalize your pop results to the population. And when the sample, when the sample is not representative, actually you don't need to calculate the p-value. We don't have something like accepted or rejected based the results based on that. I have seen a lot of research, to be honest, within at least last 15 years. Students, researchers, they do convenience sampling, they do snowball sampling, they do quota sampling, and then they do analysis, and then they accept and reject their hypothesis according to the p-value, which is totally wrong. You can only use the p-value to accept or reject your hypothesis if your sample is representative sample. This is the most important, what you call it, issue point that you need to consider when you are planning to do a statistical analysis in order to test your research hypothesis. Clear? Yes. Any question? So far, so good. Okay. So my question is that, okay, if I'm not allowed to use the p-value in order to test my research hypothesis, my sample is not representative. So what shall I do? What is the alternative techniques? If I'm not allowed to use the p-value because my sample is not representative, what shall I do? Any idea? Size? Yes, please. Effect size? Yeah, effect size. So remember, when a sample is not a representative sample, when a sample is not a representative sample, of course, we cannot say that always it's possible to do the random sampling. No. So in some cases, there is no choice, no way. You need to do the non random sampling. So when we do a non-random sampling, instead of using the p-value, we can use the effect size to interpret our results. And remember, non-random sample, the results is only for sample, not for the population. Sometimes when we do a pilot study, the result is only for piloting. That's all. You cannot inference it. You cannot generalize it. I will talk about effect size later when I move to the sample size calculation and I will teach you how to calculate the effect size. Clear? Okay. Good. Okay, so I think uh, most of you are familiar with this uh, terminology. I mean, the sample, what is the population? The population, including all the, what you call it, subjects, uh, that at least they have one common characteristics and researcher wants to collect data among them. And the sample is one subset of the whole population. I think these are very simple. And this is the process that I explained before. We collect data from the population and then we do the analysis from the sample and then we inference to the population. Of course, we need to make sure that this sample is a representative sample. So these are some terms. I just I, I will share the slides later at the end of the session. So the target population, uh, including all the people or items with the same characteristics that one wishes to understand or study. The sampling unit is the smallest unit. Uh, sometimes I will explain about the multi-stage sampling later. Sometimes we have more than one sampling unit. Sampling unit can be 
uh, what you call it, defined according to the sampling uh, techniques or scheme. The sampling frame is the list of all the subjects in your target population that you want to take a sample from that. And the sampling scheme means the method of selection of the sample from the population. When you want to develop a sampling plan, remember that you need to explain and identify all these five steps. You have to define your population, especially uh, for the students. If you are supervising the students, make sure that your students identify and clarify all these steps in their methodology. These five requirements in the sampling plan need to explain the population. They need to identify the sampling frame, if possible, of course. This is possible. The sampling frame usually it's not available for the large population. Then what is, what is the sampling techniques? What is the sample size? I will talk about the power analysis later. And then how they want to implement these sampling techniques or sampling protocol. There are many factors affecting on sampling design. One is the research objective. Whether your research objective are exploratory or explanatory, the degree of accuracy usually we consider 0.05% as minimum acceptable degree of accuracy. The time frame, suppose that you want to collect data, correct? And you have a limited time. For example, I had a student from Faculty of Medicine. Uh, when we calculated the sample size, the sample size was, if I'm not mistaken, around 300. And if the student wanted to collect full field this 300, because the number of patients per month, if I'm not mistaken, for that particular disease was two to three patients per month. So it means yearly, the expected sample was around 36. And if she wanted to fulfill this 300 from the UMMC, she needed to stay for seven years or eight years, which is impossible as a master's student. Resource, sometimes you don't have enough budget to collect adequate data. Another student with, uh, that he wanted to collect data, he, if I'm not mistaken, he was from uh, molecular gen the depart Department of Molecular Genetics, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, for sequencing of a sample, DNA sample, it is very costly, but the total budget that they had was limited to only cover only 100 samples. So sometimes uh, these factors affecting on your what you call it sampling design and sampling plan of course the statistical techniques also is another what you call it factors affecting on your sampling design the research scope you can manipulate you can change you can modify the research scope when you not when you are not able to collect data for example when you target on malaysian people then you need to go to all for example in a certain disease then you need to collect to go to many medical centers to collect data. But sometimes you can change the research scope based on feasibility and availability of the resources. For example, you can change it from all Malaysia to Kuala Lumpur area, to Selangor area, even PPUM, UMMC. Correct? And then uh, finally, the knowledge about the target population. Uh, I will talk about this. This can be related to sample size calculation because when you want to calculate the sample size, you need to know about the effect size. And effect size usually we collect it from the literature, correct? From the similar population. There are two types of sampling techniques probability sampling or random sampling, and the other is non random or non probable sampling. So, Let's start with the non-probable sampling. So when we talk about non-probable sampling means the subjects in the populations, they have no equal chance of selection. When, when you don't have this condition, then it is not possible to calculate the sampling error. That's why p-value, despite the software, okay, remember, softwares are not enough intelligent to, to detect whether your sample is random or not. 
any kind of data, if you enter to the statistical software, if you run the analysis, definitely you will get the p-value. It does not mean that uh, that p-value is correct. No. Actually, the data that you have collected based on non-random samples cannot be subjected to any kind of analysis in order to calculate the p-value. Correct? So, when you have a non-random, non-probable, then the sampling error cannot be calculated. There are four types of the sampling techniques, non-probable sampling or non-random sampling. The convenience, we call it ease of access. A snowball, friend of friend, purposive or judgmental, and then finally the quota sample. What is the convenience or accidental sampling? Especially when you don't have time to do, a, because sometimes we just want to explore the situation and we are not planning to use that data in a large scale, right? Especially, for example, when we are facing with such outbreak like uh, COVID-19, sometimes you need some basic information in order to manage the, some activities, especially when you want to do pilot study. The pilot, the pilot study is a typical example of convenience sampling. Yeah, ideally, it should be a random sample, but since sometimes we, we are facing with some uh, limitation in terms of time, uh, that, that's why we try to collect some information from the population. And we are not planning to inference that population, the, 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 that information to the population. So that's why we try to collect data very fast. The time is one of the key factors, right? Uh, especially for the pilot study, sometimes we try to just measure the reliability of the instrument, correct? That's why it is not necessary to go and run a random sampling because it is time, it, you, you need time and you need probably you need more time and probably more budget to do a random sampling because, for example, if you want to collect data from a random sample from the Kuala Lumpur area, you need to go to many places, right? But it is costly, time also. Anyhow, this uh, convenience sampling, correct, which is called ease of access, can be done through your friends, your colleagues. You, you go, for example, to a single mall and then collect some data. Of course, this sample is biased. And again, you cannot calculate the p-value. But as I mentioned, it depends on the purpose of doing that convenience sampling. So it is very easy. And of course, time and cost, uh, you, can do, you can do it very fast. The second techniques of non-random sampling is a snowball sampling. Always you start with a small sample at the end, correct? Through the process, the samples will be in sample size will be increased. So usually this kind of sampling techniques can be done among some secretive or hard to reach population. For example, if you are facing with some social stigma, illegal activities, correct? Then you can go through this kind of samples. Homeless people. The homeless people are not, the population is not available, right? Sometimes you are looking for a specific disease, which is not common. So victims of the sexual assault, right? Terrorists, hackers. When you are facing with some kind of population, it is not easy to collect data based on the random sampling, even difficult to, uh, to reach to those subjects. So that's why always we try to go through the social connection or networking. So you find a person who has that criteria and from that person you can ask if they know because sometimes this kind of subjects, they, they know each other, they have some relationship, they have some networks, they can easily access to them. Okay, let me to give you an example. Almost 15 years or more than 15 years ago, I decided to do a study on drinking alcohol among young people in Iran. That's time. Uh, in Iran, actually, drinking, uh, selling, buying of liquor and alcohol is not allowed. If they find you, uh, you will be arrested and you will send to the court and jail. 
So, but we know that this is a, a social phenomenon, right? Underground, everything's underground. So people, especially young people, they access. But if you go and collect data from, uh, from normal people in the community, in the population, in the city, no one will tell you that I'm drinking alcohol. Because if they say that I drink alcohol, they will be arrested. They, they, uh, this is the fear, correct, among the peoples. So what I did during that time to collect data, I trained 15 of my students in university because the young people, they have their own network, they trust to each other. I trained, if I'm not mistaken, 30, uh, 30 uh, of my students for collection of data as an amateur. So what I did, I trained them and I sent them to the, I mean, to, the, to their networks. And I asked them, please, try to complete this questionnaire and find other peoples. So it was the only way that, because all the, what do you call it, uh, we did not collect any personal information. Of course, you trust your friends rather than a, peer, a person that you don't have any connection or you don't know them. So through this process, we try to, what do you call it? Uh, there is no choice. Remember, there is no choice. And this is the best way. At least through this procedure, you can collect some information. You can generate some information regarding to this research uh, questions or the problem that you are facing in the, in the population. So, uh, of course, since again, the people who are not inside your network, they don't have chance of selection. Again, the sampling error cannot be calculated. The sampling bias cannot be measured. So there are three types of the snowball sampling. The first one is linear. Each subject refer you to another subject. The second techniques, the second approach is called exponential. There are two exponential, means the first subject refer you to multiple or more than one subjects. And again, each subject you will request to introduce you more than one, as much as they can. And then they, you, this is exponential, non-discriminative snowball sampling, because we collect all the data. So the some of the statisticians advise to do the non, uh, sorry, discriminative snowball sampling. The reason is that because when they do the discriminative snowball sampling, they try maybe to close this uh, sampling techniques to a random sampling. Sometimes the selection maybe is based on some criteria. Sometimes, no, it is based on the random. For example, if the first subject introduced you four other subjects, maybe among them you randomly select one and then you just proceed. It's a kind of semi-randomized snowball sampling, right? So then possibly you can calculate the p-value for this kind of sampling. Why? Because there was a random selection, not fully random selection, because the first subject probably was not selected randomly, but the rest can be selected from that network. Of course, this sampling can be done fast, it's low cost, and of course, for the it's very effective for the hesitant subjects and secretive groups. Clear? Yes. Any question? Any issue? <laughs> no. Okay. So the next non-probable sampling is called judgmental or purposive sampling. So sometimes, look at the figure, I think it's easy to understand from the figure. You have a heterogeneous population, right? But the sample that you select is only the green subject, right? So this sampling is called purposive sampling. Despite in the sample, in the population, we have different subjects with different color, right? But the researcher only focus on a certain subgroup of the population. So means, uh, for example, you, you maybe you exclude the subjects based on some criteria. And of course, the results will not be, will not be able to generalize to the whole population, only among the, that subsample. 
The other name of this sampling is alterative sampling also. The last non-probable or non-random sampling is quota sampling. Actually, some of the students or researchers may be confused between this and stratified sampling. Again, in this sample, we have a heterogeneous population. And my sample also is a heterogeneous sample. But the problem is only the, 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 the proportion of the subcategory. I have some, uh, some what do you call it, uh, subcategories in the main population. As you can see here, we have three types of fishes in this fish tank with different color. Of course, the purple one is 10, right? The green is six and the yellow is three. In the original population, the highest frequency ratio belong to the purple, followed by green, and the last, the lowest frequency or uh, percentage belong to the yellow. But when you collect data, you ignore that proportion, and you collect equal number of each subcategory or subspecies, for example, from this fish tank. So this is called quota sampling. So you keep the heterogeneity in your sample, same as population, but the only problem is that you have a same quota for each subcategory. Later, you can see here, I will show you in the stratified sampling. A stratified sampling also is a, it's a kind of random sampling. Heterogeneous population, the sample also will be heterogeneous, but we follow the proportion of subjects in the population, right? So this is uh, this is called quota sampling. <clears throat> Again, you cannot inference this result in population. For example, in Malay in Malaysia, we have three ethnicity: Malay, Chinese, Indian. Correct. Majority are Malay, followed by Chinese and Indian. If you collect equal number of Malay, Chinese, Indian, and you compare it, this result cannot be inferred to the population. Why? Because you are not following the same proportion in the population. Clear? Yes. Good. Second techniques. Uh, that we always prefer to do it is random sampling or probability samples. Uh, this is based on the random selection of the subject from the population. The first one is simple random sampling. Actually, the simple random sampling, it's I think most of you are familiar. Everybody in the population that has equal chance of selection. In a single step, you can withdraw the subject from the population based on the random numbers. Right. So, uh, of course, for this kind of sampling, you need the, you can calculate the sampling error means you can calculate the p-value. But for this kind of sampling, you need a complete list of all subjects in your population, and that list should be always up to date. Correct. So usually we do not advise, and it's not possible to do this kind of simple random sampling for a large population. Why? because in such cases you don't have any access to the frame list or sampling the name list of all the subjects in the population. Usually when we talk about random sampling, you need a random numbers. In the old school techniques, we always uh, look for the random number from the literature, from the statistical book. If you search random numbers, Table. So in look at here. This is all the random numbers in all the statistical textbook. Always they provide such such tables to make it easy for the researcher to do the random numbers. But nowadays we don't need to this to go through this all techniques, right? So why? Because there are many online uh, calculator. Uh, that are available from the web. One of them is the random ORG. So if I go to the random ORG, random ORG, if you go to the random ORG, it's one of the best website to create a random set of numbers. Look at here, 
in the in the home page you can click here and then you can generate some run even if you search in google random numbers even in S in google you can generate for example i have 5000 subjects and then i want to generate numbers the google also provided these options in the what do you call it as one of the facility that you can create and generate random numbers by google but of course academically better to use some well known website and this is one of the website that always i advise my client and students to use it if you go to the random numbers integer calculator you can create a sequence generator or integer generators integer set generators right there are different options that you can try and uh, find other what you call it uh, facilities provided by these websites for example if i want to select 100 subjects among 3000 students correct so if i just click on get numbers this is random numbers generated correct by random org among from 1 to 3000 including 100 subjects suppose that I want to convert them to the two groups. For example, you are planning to run an experimental study, control and intervention. Then I convert it to the one column. Then the system will generate you randomly two set of data. Correct? No matter whether you want to do the you want to do experimental study or survey study, easily you can select the a set of random numbers between two. Uh, limit to uh, in a range, right? So this is one of the well-known website. If you don't access to internet, again you you can use the Excel. Let me to show you in Excel. Also, you can create random numbers. Many of the statistical softwares provide this option. Look at here. If I Suppose that you want to create a random numbers, always in SPSS to apply the function, you have to click. First, you would need to enter the equal, equal, then random. If you look at here, when I click RA, this is the random. This is the random number between zero and one, and then this is a random number between. So when you create between this, for example, I want to create a random number between one and 3000 and then enter so if i drag it as you can see here and remember always you need if you want if you want to apply this number you need to copy this number and paste it somewhere as a text because anytime if you refresh your screen if you close and open it the numbers will be changed so that's why always try to copy this number and paste it as value right if you space don't as a formula as a value and then then you can set then you see again the numbers change so this is another function that you can create random numbers in spss in x sorry in excel so these are some links that i shared here for you for for those people who are interested to uh, use and experience other calculator. Okay. Uh, can we have a short break, five minutes, and we start again at 11? Are you okay? Sure. Okay. Uh, just share with you something that maybe you are interested to know about. You remember I talked about the, uh, the content analysis? Uh, especially for um, maybe some people from the uh, linguistic or uh, social science that they work on text. So SPSS uh, actually introduced a new modeler. This modeler is one of the extension SPSS that you can do. You can convert your data, your text to the data, and you can uh, create some predictive models based on the text analysis. This is one of the interesting uh, what they call it softwares that you can it, it works based on the text so you 
the system, the softwares, uh, actually read the text and you can extract, you can do the cluster analysis based on, it's very uh, advanced, uh, use advanced technology based on the data analytics, text analytics software. It's on anal uh, text analytics software that works based on the advanced technology in data mining algorithms based on the content. So for those people who uh, are from some field that deal with some kind of text analysis that advise them to uh, go through and learn about SPSS modeler. But this SPSS modeler, unfortunately, this software is not available in our SPSS under UM. You have to order it uh, by yourself. And if I'm not mistaken, it's about 1,000 US dollar. But it is amazing software to create and come with, uh, what you call it, look at here, for example, you can create a predictive model based on the SPSS modelers, based on the text analysis. Okay, back to our discussion about the random sampling. So the next random sampling is systematic random sampling. The systematic random sampling is based on arranging of the target population based on uh, some certain characteristics and selecting of these subjects in at regular intervals based on that list. Oops, sorry. Of course, a starting point always is based on the random selection. And then followed by that, you can proceed of selection of the every car element. The car is called sampling fraction. For example, if your population is 1,000 and you want to select 100 subjects, this is your N and this is your sample size. The sampling fraction will be 1,000 divided by 10 means, sorry, divided by 100, will be 10. So means in the order you select by this interval the subjects. The initial, the starting point always should be based on the random selection and then followed by that, core elements you skip and then you select the next one. For example, the sampling size was, uh, what you call it, sometimes it can be done based on the time also. I will talk about it in the in the next slides. So again, I just want to share you one of my uh, experience in running in systematic uh, sampling. Systematic sampling cannot be done with the large population. Of course, you have some difficulties to arrange the the subjects in an order. So that's why uh, usually we do it in a small population. Correct. So uh, just to share with you one of uh, my students uh, study that we did a random systematic random sampling among the students uh, around six seven years ago uh, we decided to do the systematic random sampling among undergraduate students in one of the university in Malaysia that time we knew that all the students during the registration they had to submit uh, some documents to the administration building so what we did during the, that 14 days, the students, uh, because the total number of students was around 20,000 and the sample size was 100, uh, for, sorry, the sample size was around 400. So we find that uh, out of each 50 students, we can select one of them. So during the registration, the students collected data in front of the administration buildings. So he always, he, he started he started the first starting point as a random numbers and then skip 50 students and then move to the other students. So during 14 days, he collected adequate numbers. Despite it was not fully systematic random sampling because we did not order it according to some criteria because the students, they come based on their, what do you call it, choice. So, but it was a, it was it was considered as a kind of systematic sampling because we applied this sampling fraction to select the subjects. 
The next slide is about the stratified sampling. Of course, when we want to do a stratified sampling, the, the, the population is a heterogeneous population, but according to a certain characteristics, we can create some homogeneous subgroups. For example, and these sub subgroups are called strata. For example, if you want to collect data among students with different level of education, for example, PhD student, master and bachelor. So each of them is called a strata. And then we collect data from the strata based on their proportion. So this is the one that I just showed you before. As you can see here, the population is a heterogeneous population, three colors, correct? But what we need to do, we need to calculate the sampling proportion for each subcategory, for each strata. And then when you want to collect data, you need to apply this proportion in final sample, correct? Any questions till now? No. The next sampling techniques, which is called random sampling, is cluster random sampling. Usually, we do this sampling for based on the geographical clusters. When you want to collect data from, uh, for example, entire a city or district, then we advise to use this cluster sampling. In the cluster sampling, this is the typical example. Suppose that you want to collect data from a city or from a town, then of course there are some districts or sections, uh, and it is not possible to collect all districts or cover all the sections. In the first stage, we just select randomly some of this section. These are not a strata because they are not homogeneous. These are called cluster because in a strata, if you remember in a strata, a strata are homogeneous subgroups. But in cluster, these subgroups are not homogeneous. They are heterogeneous. So that's why it is called cluster sampling. And remember, as long as you select some of these subgroups, heterogeneous subgroups, it is kind of cluster sampling. So once you select in the first stage randomly some of these sections, and then from each section, then you can collect data according to the population size from each section. One of the new techniques actually was one of the common techniques when you are going to collect data from a large population, it's multi-stage sampling. The multi-stage sampling is a complex, a combination of all sampling techniques that we have discussed till now. Correct? So the multi-stage sampling is a complex form of cluster sampling. So let me to give you an example. This is a real example. So suppose that we decided to collect data from regarding to smoking among school uh, children in the whole Malaysia. Of course, it was not possible to collect data from the whole country, from all the school children. What we did in the first stage we selected five states randomly. So this is a kind of cluster sampling. Out of, uh, what, as you can see here, out of 14 states, we select five states randomly. And this is because maybe you ask yourself, why five? Why not six? Why not four? This is because of the budget, because of the budget and time and manpower. So remember, I already explained that the sampling scheme can, some of the, some factors can affect on this, your sampling scheme. One of them is the scope, budget, time, other factors. So in our research that we conducted in the whole Malaysia, we, did, we, did, we decided to select five states randomly. But even in this study, we try to do a kind of a stratification first. So means we select north, east, south, and center, something like that. From each area, from each geographical area, then we select one state randomly. 
And from each state, again, we selected five city again randomly. This five area or city were selected randomly. In the next stage, from because this, the, the researcher decided to compare between rural and urban, it was one of the objective. That's why we select both rural and urban area. This is a stratified. In the stage four, from each area, for example, we have five area. In each area, we selected both rural and urban area. From each section, again, we selected three schools randomly. This is again cluster. And then finally, in each school, we apply a simple random sampling. Why? Because we access to the name list of all students in a school. If you remember, I explained about the sampling unit. That's why in each state, the unit of sampling is different from other stage. At the first stage, the primary sampling unit was a state. Then in the stage two, the sampling unit was area or cities. At stage three, the sampling unit was the area, rural or urban area. Stage four was a school. And at stage five, individual students, individuals. This Can is kind of, yes, please. Okay, um, how do you say that it's representative of Malaysia? Because you've left out um, West Malaysia, Sabah Sarawak is not in it, so this is only like Mong Po, yes. Peninsula Malaysia. Yes, and right. the other thing is that the other thing is that wouldn't that be representative of only those states rather than like um, if you take cities from different different states, wouldn't that be more representative of Malaysia? You are totally right. Ideally, yeah, it should be better from all states. But the, as I mentioned, the problem was that other resources that there was some limitation, right? Uh, the, this study was not, uh, did not cover the Sabah and Sarawak. We just look at the East, uh, West Malaysia, correct? And the, because the, the target population was this area, not Sabah and Sarawak. And yeah, I, ideally it was, uh, it was great if we were able to collect data from all the states. But as long as this state selected randomly, it's a kind of cluster samplings. Remember, this when we talk about multi-stage sampling, we cannot say that it's 100% representativeness of the population. But we do our best always to come with such a random procedure, so random selection, correct? Because the states, cities, the rural, the schools, all were selected randomly. Yeah, I agree with you. It was very ideal if we collect data from all states rather than only five states. But this was related to the limitation that we had. Clear? So, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, in this context, uh, we do we still use the p-value? Um, for yes. yes, still still we can use p-value, yeah. Because it's a kind of random selection. Remember, if in the process, if you remember even in the snowball sampling, you remember the snowball sampling, when I talk about the non-discriminative, sorry, discriminative snowball sampling, I said that sometimes if you apply a random selection, even through the snowball sampling, still you can use the p-value. If you apply any kind of random selection in the process of selecting subjects, yeah, you can still use the p-value and you can calculate your, you can estimate the sampling error or sampling bias. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, one more thing that you need to know, uh, yeah, you, you talk about the sampling, uh, what you call it, bias in multi-stage sampling. Because the population of, for example, Kuala Lumpur, Selangor is not same as Terengganu, is not same as Johor, is not same as Malacca, right? So that's why when we do a multi-stage sampling, 
it's a kind of complex sampling, then you need to calculate the sampling weight. When we calculate the sampling say, weight, we try to compensate over or under estimation of our, uh, what you call it, finding based on the, what you call it, sample population size. So in order to calculate the sampling weight, you need to define the sampling design the steps and each at each step you need to calculate the weight. And the final weight should be considered based on all steps. Let me to give you, show you an example. Okay, one more thing, when you are dealing with a multi-stage sampling, then you need to do your analysis is based on the complex sampling. So when you go and run the complex sampling, of course, you need to design and define your sampling scheme. So, but when you want to apply the complex sample analysis and do the, and remember all these things because of adjustment in your sampling bias, sampling error. It's not a simple random sampling. That's why you need to adjust your final uh, sample based on the weightage. And the analysis is, this complex samples analysis is, is based on the weightage. So how we can calculate the weightage? This is another example. One of my students uh, in another country, he selected five states randomly, correct? Because he wanted to collect data among nurses. So what we did, we knew that in state one, there was 13, there were 13 hospitals, another state 19 hospitals, different number of hospitals was uh, available in different states. So according to, again, according to the budget, we decided to select 30% of hospitals. So what we did in the first stage, randomly we selected 30%, it means equal to, uh, what do you call it, four, eight, four, nine hospitals out of total number of hospitals in each state. Uh, remember, this percentage, this proportion depends on your, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, money, budget, manpower, Permission, sometimes maybe you cannot, even if you decide to collect data from all hospitals, maybe uh, they will not give you any permission to go through all hospitals. So there are some other factors that can affect on your sampling scheme. But what we did, we decided to collect 30% of hospitals in each state. So now what we need to do, we need to calculate the weightage, the sampling weightage for a stage one. A stage one is selection of the hospitals. So you need to divide, you need to divide the total number of hospitals. If you look at here, this is the weight for each state. So 3.25, 3.25 is the ratio of 13 divided by four. This is called sampling, what do you call it? wait for a stage one. So in the second stage, out of 6,000 nurses in the first four hospitals, the, the researcher collected 250 questionnaires. So what we did in the next step, we, do, we did a random selection from the all four selected hospitals. Actually, I summarized them, I simplified this. It was much more extensive, but I tried to simplify this process. Uh, out of 6,250 subjects were selected. So again, sampling weight two also was calculated based on the ratio of the total number of nurses by total number of nurses that we have collected from these four selected hospitals. So then again, we calculate another sampling weight with the stage two. So in order to calculate the to overall sampling weight, you need to multiply these two. 
And then when you want to analyze the data, all subjects from state one should be weighted by 78. All subjects from state B should be weighted by 57. So as you can see here, these weights are not same. The reason that we apply this weight to adjust our sampling error, estimation of sampling bias. You cannot simply analyze them without considering the weight because definitely the number of hospitals, the number of nurses were not same. Correct? So that's why you need to apply the sampling weight and run the analysis later in SPSS. If I show you in SPSS, Some of the statistical softwares provide this option for you. SPSS is one of the best software to deal with the complex sampling. Look at here when you want to uh, first, okay, let me to open a data. So look at here, you need to create your plan for, for example, let me to just, save a file on desktop test. So now look at here, you need to identify the strata, you need to identify the cluster, and then you need to identify the sampling weight, correct? So followed by that, once you define the weightage, the not which, which is the cluster, which is the, how many strata do you have, Followed by that, then you can analyze your data because this analysis is different. You have the frequency analysis here, but under complex analysis also you have the frequency. Then you need to read your plan, this, the sampling, the complex sampling plan that you already designed. You remember I, 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 I tried to save it, but I did not save it actually. So once you read, once you read your plan, then you can analyze your data under complex sampling. This is due to adjustment in your sampling error. Clear? Any question? Okay. So there is another kind of sampling, which is kind, it's a kind of multi-stage sampling. We say time location sampling or time venue sampling. So it's a kind of multi-stage sampling, especially, especially when you are uh, dealing with some, especially in medical settings. In the, this is a specific kind of sampling that we advise uh, when the students or researchers work in medical setting, in a hospital, in a clinic. So as you can see here, the duration of data collection, we can randomly select some of the days, AM or PM, and this is the centers. So uh, the name of this sampling is TLS, time location sampling, and it is a kind of multi-stage sampling because again, we select the day location, afternoon or morning sessions randomly. Okay, the next, we, we finish almost the random sampling. Now I'm going to talk about another kind of sampling which is called census or universal sampling. The universal sampling is a kind of sampling techniques that you collect and target to the entire population. So it means you collect the whole, in, all the information. This can be done when the population is very small, correct? So especially for those people who are from medical fields, a retrospective study, when you go and collect data from the medical records within a certain duration of time, for example, this study was conducted in Malaysia, and then they collected data, uh, for example, for a certain time. Some, some of them, maybe they mentioned that, okay, here, look at here. They collected data from the medical registry, medical records from 2004 to 2008. 
So this study applied the census sampling techniques. Why? Because they collected all available data. So the, the other terms is universal sampling. So census or universal sampling can be applied when you collect all available data, correct? So now my question is that, do I need to calculate the p-value again here? Do I need to calculate the sampling bias here? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, I okay. need to tell it. Say something. <laughs> Become stressed that I lost my connection. <laughs> so can I can I use the P value? Remember, when you are dealing again, I just want to refer you to the first slide. If you remember the P value. The p value was the p value was the amount of your sampling bias. But when I collect the whole population, do I need to calculate this bias? No, my results is unbiased. This is another common problem among many researchers. Unfortunately, they do the sampling census or universal sampling. And suddenly, they again, they calculate the p-value and then they judge the results according to the p-value. This is wrong. So in this case, if you collect all available data, again, you need to use exploratory approach. You need to just describe your sample. You do not need to calculate the p-value and say that it is significant or something is not significant. No. Again, the judge should be based on the p-value, sorry, effect size. So means you need to go through and uh, calculate the effect size for each research objective rather than the p-value. And unfortunately, this is a common mistake among many researchers. I can say more than 80% of people who do the census or universal sampling mistakenly they judge according to the p-value and this is wrong even in top high impact journals why because of misunderstanding the concept of the sampling no matter any kind of data if you just put it in the software run the analysis definitely you will get the p-value but you need to decide whether i'm allowed or not to use that kind of uh, analysis is clear. Okay. Yep. Good. So now there is one more thing that I just want to highlight regarding to the. Uh, I forgot to actually to mention about the sam cluster sampling. Uh, this is about the sample size. I will discuss about it later, not now. I need to change the place of these two. Sorry. At the end of my presentation here. Sorry. Misplaced. Okay, now we move to the one of the interesting part of this uh, workshop that this is one of the common questions that I have been asked from many, many clients during almost five years running the statistical consultation clinic under EDEC and under RMC in Faculty of Medicine. To be honest, I can say more than 30%, 40% of clients that who came to my clinic for last five years, their common question is that, what is the required sample size for my study? So the sample size calculation actually is one of the critical factors that can affect on the accuracy of your results, on your estimation, on the, uh, your, your the, the accuracy of the information that you generate through your study. So, of course, again, the sample size can be um, 
it depends on some factors like budget time, as I mentioned, statistical. We already discussed about this. So there are two techniques. I classified as a two techniques to approach in terms of sample size calculation. I, I name it as a classical, me cl classical methods. The classical methods, I mean all the school techniques, outdated school techniques, some of them are rule of thumbs. For example, in some of the statistical books, you can find that they advise that if you have experimental study, the minimum number of samples per each group should be 13, 30 to 15 to 30. So if you are applying a survey questionnaire, the number of samples should be 5 to 10 for each item in your questionnaire. For example, if I have a questionnaire consists of 100 questions, 100 items, then the sample size should be between 500 to 1000. In the classical approach, sometimes the researcher justify their sample size according to the similar studies based on the literature. And in a bit advanced techniques, they use some formula. And unfortunately, there is only one formula. And this is Cochrane or Morgan formula. This formula is only based of uh, proportion of or prevalence not based on other characteristics. This Morgan table belonged to the 1960s. This formula belonged to the 1960s, so it means almost 60 years ago. But unfortunately, still, many researchers, students, still use this old formula. I'm not saying it's wrong, but but it is only valid for a very limited number of research objectives which are based on the prevalence, not other research objectives. So, of course, if you apply larger sample size, the sampling error will be smaller. I mean, this is the relationship between the sample size and sampling error or uh, what you call it, your estimation for the p-value. I, I will show you something later. Okay, this is the table that some of the researcher students still refer to this table. This table actually is the outcome of the same formula. So this is called Morgan table. It's based on the confidence, based on the margin of error and population size. But again, remember, this is based on proportion. It cannot be applied for any other kind of research uh, objective or research design. So some of my students, they say that, Dr. Mahmoud, I calculate my sample size with online calculator. So remember, behind this online calculator, still there is an old formula. It does not mean that when you are using the online calculator, it shows an accurate estimation and up-to-date techniques. Yeah, they used up-to-date approach to show the sample size calculation. But it does not mean that the, the concept, the algorithm behind this calculator is up to date. It is outdated. So I mean, still they use an old formula to calculate the sample size uh, by this online calculator. OK, before moving to the sample size calculation, I just want to talk about two things. One is the sample effect size. Sorry, one is the type of error. The other is effect size. Because uh, in the new approaches in sample size calculation, in up-to-date latest approach in sample size calculation, we need to understand these two concepts. One is type errors, the other is effect size. So what does it mean type error? Okay, look at here. Anytime when we do a study, there is two possibility, right? Four possibilities, sorry. Maybe your hypothesis is Maybe your hypothesis is, is true in the population and you accept it. That is good. This is right. This is right decision. If it's false and you reject it, again, you have done a right decision, right? But if it's true and mistakenly through your research, you reject this hypothesis, 
This is called type error one. Type error one is exactly the same as your p-value. So the nature of the p-value is same as alpha. So that's why we always set alpha by 0 0.05 and we compare this is the maximum acceptable type error one and then we compare our p-value by 5%. The other errors that can be happen in your study is type error two. It means when your hypothesis is, is false in the population and you do not reject it, means you accept it. This is also a wrong decision. These two are wrong decision. So the first one is called type error one and the second is called type error two. Type error one, all of you are familiar. This is alpha and always we fix it with 5%. Even in the old techniques, look at here, this is the alpha. When, we, when the alpha is 5%, your confidence is 95%. So it means all, in all this calculation, it's already considered the alpha. That's why in the formula also, it's, there is an alpha. So look at here, in the formula, this Z is Z of alpha. This is a standardized value from the Z score based on the defined alpha, which is always 5%. And Z always is 1.96. Z of 5%. But the point is that we know that there is two possibilities of error. In the sample size calculation, always we ignore this one. That's why in the new Okay, so one minus beta is called power. The power, the power is the probability of correctly rejection of false null hypotheses. So in the sample size calculation, in the new approach, in the new techniques, methods, we use both alpha and beta. So that's why they call this kind of analysis is power analysis. So means in order to calculate the sample size in the new approach, you need to identify set both alpha and beta. So the minimum acceptable level of alpha is 80%. So means, sorry, the power. So this is the power. So means when the power is 80%, the maximum acceptable type error two is 0.2 or 20 percent. Ideally, in ideal situation, alpha and beta 5 percent is perfect. But since the type error one is much more important for us, we, we emphasize on alpha less than beta. That's why in beta we are a bit flexible and we can increase the beta to 0.2 or 20 percent. So the point is that in the new approach of sample size calculation, if you are trying to publish a paper in high impact journals, definitely they will request the sample size calculation based on the power analysis. And remember, the power analysis, the sample size calculation should be based on each objective separately. Suppose that you have five objectives in your research. You need to calculate the sample size for each objective separately, not a unique and single sample size calculation. No, you need to calculate, especially if you are supervising your students, because some of you are lecturer uh, in the teaching, <laughs> correct? So you need to ask your students to calculate the sample size according to each objective. And according to each outcome, sometimes you are dealing with many variables so then you need to calculate the sample size according to the objective and outcomes. That's why sometimes maybe you need to calculate 10 sample size, 15 sample size. And then in this process, we always consider the highest number to cover all other objectives. Clear? 
Any question regarding to the the power? No. Thank okay. you. Good. Please let me know if you, if you need some more explanation. Because some of you maybe you are not from the quanti and sometimes if there is anything unclear, let me know. So the next in the new techniques of sample size calculation beside the power alpha, beta, also we need to calculate the effect size. What is the effect size? Can I ask you a question? Let me to stop sharing and let me to ask you a question. Please answer to my question. Are Malaysian and American are different in terms of their body height? The body height of Malaysian and American are different, is different or not? Different. Can I say American are taller than Malaysian? Yes or no? Yes. How fast? Have you done a study to confirm it? No, it's an obvious difference. We don't need to prove it, right? With a few cases, we can prove it. So the, the effect size actually is the magnitude of a standardized difference or relationship, correct? Is there any relationship between body weight and the amount of food that you eat? Yes, right? Some of the some of this relationship are, are obvious, uh, what do you call it, uh, differences or relationship. So, effect size reflect the magnitude of difference in a standard form. If I ask you, is there any difference between Malaysian and Indonesian in terms of their body height? So, may you say, no, I don't know. Of course, because if there is any difference, that difference is not an obvious difference. We have to go and check, right? So the effect size is a standardized form of uh, difference or relationship. There are different types of effect size. Maybe some of you only are familiar with the Cohen D, which is applicable for the differences so we have different family of effect size effect size for the correlation like pearson correlation coefficient r square coefficient of determination eta square omega square and f square and q cohen's q for the difference family there are many different types of effect size cohen's d is the one of the common one glass delta hg phi root mean square Correct? And for the categorical family, odd ratio, risk relative, risk difference, Cohen's H, and Cohen's W. So all of them are different types of effect size. Even if you search in the Google effect, effect size for, so look at here. Effect size for ANOVA, effect size for multiple regression, effect size for T-test, for linear regression, for correlation, for mon whitney There are different types of effect size. Correct? But let me to show you and teach you one of the simplest form of the effect size, which is related to the comparison of two mean. Okay, remember, there is a link between sample size calculation in the new techniques with the research objective and the statistical techniques that you are planning to apply on your data. Suppose that if you have a pre-test, post-test data, you want to compare between and after, for example, intervention, you want to subject your students to a new techniques of teaching, new te teaching approach. Right, you measure their outcomes before and after the class, and then your satisfaction, and then you want to compare it. So you need to know it from the beginning what kind of a statistical test you need to you need to apply, and then of course that will be a per t test. 
So for the PERT test, then you need to calculate your sample size prior to run your main study. Why? Because you need to calculate your sample size. The sample size is based on the effect size for this particular statistical test, which can cover your objective. So all of them are linked together. That's why when you are designing your research plan, correct, you need to know from the beginning what kind of statistical test you are planning to apply. And based on that, you need to calculate your sample size. I will teach you later how you can calculate the effect size according to each research objective. There are many different kinds, as I mentioned, there are many different kinds of statistical tools, correct? And uh, you, can, you can apply one of these calculator. For example, if you want to apply multiple regression, then you need to go look at here, effect size in a statistic, then multiple regression using effect. Maybe if you add calculator at the end, calculator, effect size multiple regression calculator, then look at here, free effect size calculator for multiple regression analysis. This should be done before running the study. So look at here, this is the uh, based on the power of 80%. So this is the RA square. I, I will teach you something later, not now. I don't want to confuse you. Go back to the slides. So now we found that the effect size is in a standardized magnitude of difference or relationship or association, which quantify the strength of relationship or differences. So one of the simplest, uh, what you call it, the standardized uh, effect size is Cohen D. Usually we apply the Cohen D to show the magnitude of difference between two means to average, right? So if you go to this website, you go to the effect size calculator, Dr. Lee Becker from the University of Colorado, United States. If you go to the homepage, as you can see here, this guy created an online calculator to calculate the effect size based on the Cohen D for mean difference, right? Suppose that the quality of life among female, if you remember, was 1.30 with a standard deviation of 2.3. Among female, among male, it was 8.25 with a standard deviation of 3.65. So now if you click compute, the system will apply the same formula and then you can see here, the effect size is how much? Can you see the effect size? 0 0.99, right? So how can I interpret this, uh, what you call it, effect size? If you click on the lecture notes, effect size lecture notes, you can, uh, you can access to some uh, explanation for the effect size. If I go to the, this effect size, a standardized difference between two groups, Cohen D. So this is explanation, this is the formula, correct? And then this is the interpretation. So if effect size is 0 0.2, means there is a small differences. A small differences means only 14% of subjects probably are different. When effect size is 0 0.5, it's medium, means at least 33% in both groups are not same. If the effect size is large, means almost 50% of subjects are not same. And if effect size is two, means 80% of subjects are not same. So in order to show that graphically, look at here, this is, this is the effect size. When the effect size is a small, sorry, when the effect size is a small, 0 0.2, a small effect size, it means most of the subjects are similar. 83% overlap, correct, means 17% non-overlap. When the effect size is medium, it means 33% are different, but 67% of subjects still they are 
same. And when the effect size is large, means almost 50% are same and 50% are not same. And when the effect size is two, means almost 81% of subjects. So this shows that the magnitude of difference. So now if I want to ask you, the effect size between uh, the, the, the effect size of height between Malaysian and American is high or is large or small or medium, definitely it is large. And if I want to prove that effect size in a study, do I need to collect too many data? No. So that's why there is a relationship between effect size and sample size calculation. When there is, a, okay, when there is a huge difference if you collect 1,000 people, American, 1,000 Malaysian, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your budget. Correct? So there is a relationship between sample size calculation and effect size. Large effect size, you do not need to collect too many data. A small effect size, you need to collect more data. This is based on what exactly you target. Clear? Yes. Okay, can I ask you, we have not done our study yet, but how can I cal calculate the effect size? For the effect size, we need some numbers, some values. Where should, where should I take these numbers to calculate my sample size? Based on the literature? Or yes. Study? Yes, one source is literature review. So you can collect and you can calculate your sample size based on the literature. True. What is the other alternative? Any idea? Pilot study? Yes, pilot study. So remember, when we do a pilot study, of course, sometimes it, there are some other, uh, what do you call it, benefits from the pilot study. During the pilot study, you can check the reliability of your instruments, for example, and also you can check the feasibility of a study, right? Especially for those people who are from clinical, from medical, the reason that we do always pilot a study to check the feasibility of a study, the challenges, the barriers, the feedbacks of the patients, the feedback of the subjects, even for the, uh, in education also, when you want to try uh, apply an intervention before running the main study. We, adv we advise always to to run a pilot study to to overcome with unexpected uh, source of bias or error in your study. So one of the benefit of the pilot study that makes you able to calculate your effect size. So if you are going to read, if you are going to calculate the effect size according to the literature review, make sure, make sure that the, sam the, the, the sample or the article that you are planning to use is from the, it's similar from the same context that you are doing. I, I, had, I had some experience that the students, they calculated their effect size according to some literature review that are totally different from the context of the study. And it caused a lot of issue. So when you want to calculate your sample size and you need to calculate the effect size, please, first, find as much as possible a literature which is close to your context. So don't use the Western country Deep country with different, uh, what you call it, level of socioeconomic status, especially from the medical uh, perspective. The genetics is one of the factors. The, the genetics of Western peoples are different from Malaysian, Asian. So if you want to apply, and this, I had a student that he calculated the sample size. He was from, uh, I forgot actually, from the ENT department. Yeah, he calculated the sample size based on an article from a Western country. But in that country, the result indicated that the large effect size. But when we applied the same study with that calculated sample size, we found that in Malaysia, there is no difference at all. And that effect size was not achieved. So means, 
if, is, if there is any difference, we were not able to calculate it because my sample size was, our sample size was very small. So the point is that when you approach, when you collect data from the literature, make sure that the articles that you are planning to use is close to the same context. Sometimes maybe you ask yourself, okay, I found an article, but that article did not calculate, for example, the Cohen D or the mean difference. They just mentioned about the relationship. So as you can see here, this effect size converter can help you to convert different effect size to each other. So let me to show you this effect size converter. I will, I will pass it to you later after the class, after the session with my slides. So this is one of the Excel calculator that can be used to convert different effect size to each other. For example, you find an article that they reported the eta score, and then you want to convert it to the D because you need to D. So, and the eta score for that study was 0 0.58. So when you put this data, then it will be equal to 0 0.2 as a correlation. It will be equal to D as an effect size of difference. It will be equal to 2.459 as an odd ratio or F or eta square or area under care. So means you don't need necessarily to find a similar articles that apply the same statistical test, correct? So you are able, you will be able to convert different effect size to each other. Even if you search in the Google box, search box, convert effect size. So look at here, effect size converter. So the computation of different effect size, like DFR, correct? Effect size, calculator, converting among effect size. So you can apply some of this, actually, if I'm not mistaken, some statistical softwares also provide for you these options, like MedCalc. Okay, so now we are going to the end of this workshop by teaching you how to calculate your sample size by one of the free available software, which is called G-Power. So please, after me, I will give you a short break, five to 10 minutes. You can download this software, install it on your computer, because I'm going to teach you some kind of a statistical sample size calculation uh, using this G-Power. So there are many softwares that you can use the sample size calculation. And the G Power is one of the commonly used software. The, the reason is that because it's free. <laughs> you don't need to pay, correct? So please go to Google box, G Power. So you, if you set G Power, go to the first link, go to the first link, No, no, sorry, not this link. Okay. Go to this link, sorry, here. Universitat.seldorf G Power. Just click on that. And then go down. This is the help manual reference, and then go to download. So there are two links for you one for Windows, the other is for Mac OS. So please download this software. It, ta it takes a few seconds. Look at here. I just download it in my desktop. One, two, three, finish. So now you open this file and then extract this file. I extract it outside. Now this is the G powers folder. So once you open the folder, run the G power set up MSI or just directly set up. You run the setup. So once you complete the installation, please let me know. I will stop right now 12 and we will start at 12. I think five minutes enough or 10 minutes maximum enough for you to run to, to install 
take a rest and install the software and then come back to the meeting room. Okay? Clear? Okay. Okay, okay. So please download, install on your computer, and then I will be back at 12.10, nine minutes later. Okay, can we start now? Have you installed the software? Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So now let me to share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes, you can see a screen. So yes. Yes. This is a software, right? When you run the software, you can see these windows, right? Okay. In order to calculate the sample size, you need to go to the test. There are five groups of the families, test families. So means uh, correlation and regression. There are different types of regression analysis, correlation, different types of correlation, logistic regression, poison regression. In the mean, one sample, two samples, many groups, repeated measure, multivariate, ANOVA or MANOVA. So that's why you need to understand from the beginning what kind of statistical tests you are planning to apply in order to test your research objective or research hypothesis. So uh, this is one of the requirements for you to meet the statistician, correct? To make sure that uh, you are in the right track. Wrong statistical uh, analysis, if you define wrong statistical analysis, everything will be wrong. So that's why I strongly advise you if you are not sure about the appropriate statistical test that you are going to apply, try to meet the statistician, correct? It's a kind of marketing for me. <laughs> so try to do a consultation with the statistician. Make sure that the statistical test that you are planning to apply in your research is an appropriate techniques. Otherwise, everything will be wrong. So. And in order to, to find the best statistical techniques, there are two solutions. One is consultation with a statistician. The second is the literature review. Because when you do the literature review through, uh, during your research, besides, because most of the students, I saw them that they concentrate on the findings on literature review. For example, they find, okay, they just go through the literature and discuss and elaborate their literature review based on the theoretical finding, conceptual models, and limitation. Less concentrate on the methods. That is one of the problem among our students here I face. They concentrate on, when they do the literature review, they concentrate more on findings and the theoretical background of the research rather than methods. So please, if you are supervising the students as a supervisor, make sure that you, the students also they evaluate the methodology parts. So what kind of methods or statistical techniques the literature apply in order to achieve their target? This is one of the missing part in most of our students' literature review. To be honest, I have seen a few students that they look at that aspect of literature review. To me, actually, always I advise my students, please, when you do a literature review, beside the theoretical, uh, what do you call it, background, the findings, please look at the recommendation about the, st the, 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 the techniques or the, the, the methods that they apply in order to analyze their data. So, the literature review should cover all these aspects, not only the theory and findings, correct? So when you do a literature review, a deep and systematic literature review, please organize the methods, what kind of methods the literature have used in order to achieve their targets. 
and that can help you to identify the best statistical techniques in order to test your research hypotheses. So, through this approach, literature review and consultation, you can define your statistical test. Make sure that the statistical test identified properly. Otherwise, even if you use the sample size calculation by using the G power, then it can be violated. It can be questioned. I had a student a few months ago. The calculation of sample size was correct using the G power, but the problem is that in the study design was an experimental study using control and intervention over the time. It was a repeated measure, but the sample size calculation was based on pre-test, post-test two means. This is not correct. The sample size calculation should be conducted based on repeated measure. Why? Because the study design was an experimental study using pre-test, post-test, follow-up test. It was not only a cross-sectional study and comparing two groups. Despite he calculated the sample size based on the G power, but it was not acceptable. Clear? Yes. Okay, so one way that you can find your, your, your cons, you know, if you go to the, let me to show you that. So this is the research gates. I don't know how many of you are active in this social network, social media, academic social media networks. So one time, one way to, to understand what kind of a statistical test is appropriate for you, you can ask a technical questions from there, just drop your questions. Within a few days, probably you will receive some feedbacks from the experts, correct? So that's why this is, I, I believe that nowadays, this, the, any, any sort of scientific research or activity should be based on what? Networking, academic networking. To strengthen the research, try to do the networking as much as possible. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. So that's why one way to communicate with all uh, other scholar or academics through this kind of social networks and research gates is one of the best. So through this networking, you can find. Look at here. Everyday people, they try. They drop. They okay. These questions just 14 hours ago. This guy, this person asked, how do I calculate the variability and heritability among ANOVA output in SAS statistical? So there are many statistics, there are many questions. Don't shy. And look at here, someone answered to this question. Two answer. So lower type error one risk in MANOVA compared with ANOVA. Why is it the case? So look at here, he just dropped the questions here. And this guy, try to share some experience some of sometimes they provide a link for them so please don't shy this helps you to strain the body of research correct look at here this is another one this because since my expertise is a statistic correct so all the questions that i can see in my profile because uh, i i define myself as a statistician the keyword, the skill set, expertise that I put here, I define for myself, all are about the statistic. So that's why all the questions that I can see in my profile are related to the statistic. Correct? So this is a way that you can secure your research. You don't need to pay me because if you want to see me in RMC, you have to pay 150, 120 ringgit per hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so by this uh, approach, you can access to the answer of your questions free of charge. You don't need to come and see me. Just drop your questions. Other people also can help you to answer, to find your answer. Clear? So you are welcome to, to follow me. If you follow me, I will follow back you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can access. We can. We can. We can this, this is this is a platform 
for communication among academics. Correct? So look at here. I, for example, every day I upload my papers, my projects. Correct? You can access some of the, this project's full text. You can read it. You can download it. You can, if you have any questions, you can just drop your questions. Look at here. Sometimes I receive some emails. Some people, they want to request for downloading of my papers. Sometimes the papers is not free of charge. Easily you can communicate with the authors. Maybe they share with you the, art, the, the articles personally. So this is the way that you can strand the structure of your research and your academic journey. Faham, clear? Yes. Good. So now we move to the G power and we try to practice some of this sample size calculation using the G power. Suppose that um, my research objective is to compare the health, uh, the quality of life between male and female. I know that the quality of life is based on the questionnaire and the score is continuous data. Then I, need, I, need, I know that I need to do a t-test, independent t-test. So that's why I go to the test, means, and then independent groups, two independent groups. If your data is qualitative data, then you have to use the non-parametric test, which is Wilcoxon. So if it's continuous data, you go to the independent t-test. So if I click on independent t-test, look at here. In order to calculate the sample size, what you need to do? First of all, you need to define the type of the hypothesis is tails, one tail, two tails. What does it mean? Do you know? What is the difference between tail, one tail and two tail? Almost 30 participants are here. No one knows about the tails. Expect the result, uh, negative or positive, so you can decide yeah. based so, on the literature. So, yeah, as, as you know that we have two types of the hypothesis, right? When we talk about the hypothesis, we have two types of hypotheses, directional, and non-directional. So what is the directional hypothesis? In directional hypothesis, always the researcher, prior to conduct the researcher, had some expected, uh, what you call it, results. For example, I, according to the literature, most of them, they mentioned that the quality of life among female is more than male. So we already know something about the, what do you call it, the difference or relationship according to the literature or pilot study or observation. So if your hypothesis is, is directional, you mean in your hypothesis you already mentioned about the difference or relationship. Or maybe you say that, especially for example for relationship, if you want to look at the relationship between quality of life and stress. Of course, it's an obvious, this relationship is negative relationship. So it means high stress will lead to the low quality of life. So if in your hypothesis, you already define the direction, so it means you mentioned that it is expected that the female has a better quality of life than me, or in terms of relationship, you can say that the stress is negatively correlated with the quality of life among undergrad students in UM, then this is called directional hypothesis. Non-directional hypothesis means we don't know, we don't have any idea. We want to test whether female and male are different or no, or whether quality of life is correlated with their stress or no. We don't have any expectation. We don't have any idea. So in this case, we have non-directional. 
When we talk about directional hypothesis, it's always we use one tail test or one sided. Non directional is two tailed. Why? Let me to show you something here. One tailed versus two tailed. So when you have one tailed hypothesis, correct? So you put all the bias in one side. So all the the P, the, the type error one five percent you put it in the left or right. But when you have two tail, so you say that the mean, the mean is more than a constant value. You put all the error in the one side. When you have a two tail, then you have to divide that 5%, 2.5% in the right, 2.5% in the left. So that's why the Z value will be different. Correct? So I refer you for those people who are interested who are interested to know more about the one to tail test. Go to this video. Correct and watch this video. So back to the back to the G power. So now it is very important. Look at here. If I calculate sample size by one tail, you need 176 sample. If I click on two tail, then I need more data. Correct? So that's why the type of the hypothesis is also affect on your sample size calculation. This is one of the most critical consideration that need to be, uh, what you call it, uh, defined in the process of sample size calculation. Followed by that, the alpha is always 5% fixed. The beta, the power is one minus beta. As I mentioned earlier, the the minimum acceptable power is 80 percent right and then the only things that you need to define the allocation actually we always keep it one the only things that you need to define is the effect size so as you can see here there are three types of effect size a small medium or large as a default the sufferers always consider a medium effect size. But what do you need to do? You need to calculate your own effect size according to the literature. Suppose that you, you go to the literature and you can find similar studies that they compare the differences between male and female. So this is the reference one, reference two, reference three, Maybe you have five references, and according to each reference, you calculate the male and female mean and a standard deviation, and then followed by that, you calculate your effect size. In the study one, the effect size was 0 .0, 0 0.19. The other one, you calculate your effect size by that online calculator. You remember the effect size, Dr. Lee? You remember this calculator? Maybe this is only for one statistical test. Remember, this is only for Cohen D for comparing of two means. So then, for example, the second one study was conducted. They found that 27. The third study, according to the mean and the standard deviation, they found that it's 0 0.59 and so on. 0 0.3.1 and 0 0.3.3. So in order to secure your sample size, you need to take the lowest effect size. According to the reference one, which was similar to your context, the smallest effect size was 0 0.19. So that's why in order to calculate your sample size, suppose that my hypothesis is one tape, I believe that female are better than male, that's why I choose one tail, and then suppose that the effect size is one, nine. So by this, the sample size, the minimum sample size that I need to calculate to detect that effect size in one tail with type error one, 5%, type error two, 20%, 
will be 688. And that sample size will cover the adequate power. But if I increase the number, the power by 90%, definitely the sample size will be. But if I increase the effect size, for example, by 3, 3. So look at here. Definitely, I need a small sample size. So you need to play around, of course, for all this input, especially for the effect size. The one tail, two tail is very simple. This is always we fix with 5% and 20% for the type error two. The only things that you need to identify is effect size, either from a pilot study or from a literature review. So then you can calculate your sample size. So in order to calculate, in order to, uh, what do you call it, conduct this study with expected effect size of 0.33, one tail, I need 230 samples. 150 from male and 115 from the female. So always, you can also draw the charts as an evidence. Maybe you can report it, especially if you have a student that is going to do the research, ask them to draw the plots. These plots, later they can copy and then they can just paste it in their research. So this is So this is the chart. As you can see here, by 80%, the minimum power, the sample size is around 200 something. So this is the alpha, this is the effect size. But again, in front of the effect size, you need to put the reference. How did you get this effect size? From where? So you need to support your study by this effect size. The rest is nothing, correct? So now I want to give you an example. Please, I have done a study between Malay and non-Malay in terms of the score of the depression. The score of depression, we found that the score among Malaysian depression was 21 plus minus, I found it from one article, 3.6. And among non-Malay, it was 18.95 plus minus 4.9. So can you calculate for me the sample size and drop the answer in the chat box here? Just calculate it and drop your answer to the chat box. You have only two minutes. If you finish it, just drop your answer in the chat box.
146 for two sample or for one? Chung. Is it total sample size or for the both groups or for one group? For total, thank you. Others? Only one person. <laughs> what about others? The mambo, I don't know how to key in that uh, effect size. Okay, let me to show you. So you remember that uh, when we wanted to cal calculate the sample size, right? So in order to calculate the effect size, you have to go to this website, right? But actually, you don't need to go through this website. Look at here. So how much, if you click, can you see here, beside, beside effect size, we have another button, determine, right? If you click on determine, then you can just key in your information here. 21 is the mean of group one. 18.95 is the mean of group two. A standard deviation of group one is to 3.6. A standard deviation of group two is 4.9. So now you can calculate your effect size, correct? So you don't need actually to go through the website and calculate your uh, effect size by using other software. So as the G power already provided for you the samples, the effect size calculator. So in a, or in a, in a set of 33, I need to put four seven. So if I click here, calculate and transfer to the main window. So now look at here. But no one asked me. I expected a questions from all the respondents participant here. You did not ask me whether my hypothesis is two tail or one tail. I provided for you only two two means, and I asked you to calculate the sample size for a study to compare between. Uh, stress between Malaysian and non-Malaysian, but no one asked me, Dr. Mahmoud, is it directional or non-directional? So remember how easily the sample size can be can be calculated wrongly. So this is one of the requirements, and no one asked me why. Can you ask me now? <laughs> so. This hypothesis is, is non-directional. So when it's non-directional, I should use two tail, right? And now calculate. The sample size is how much? 142, 71 per each group. So if you want to report it, if you want to report, can you see here protocol of power analysis is this is the protocol. If you want to show the evidence to the panel, to the journals, if you are students, if you want to show this evidence to your supervisor, select this one. Control C, copy, and then open a Word file here. Paste. So now look at here. And in front of the effect size, I'll open a bracket. I said that Mahmoud et al. 2020. So I support this effect size by, by a reference. And followed by that, I draw the plots. Draw the plot. Right click, copy to a clipboard, and then paste it here. Beside, below this table. So now this is the evidence of sample size calculation for the current example. The most important thing is here. Look at here, information that we provided here. Effect size, two tailed, 
alpha, power, and this is the total sample size. Clear? Yes. Good. Now, the next question. I am doing, um, I decide one of other, one of the other research objective of this study is to investigate the relationship between quality of life and stress. According to the literature, we found that the relationship between quality of life and stress among the literature is 0 0.313, according to a literature. So, how much, how many samples do I need? Again, I will give you only one minute to find the answer. This is about relationship. Remember, the first one is about the comparison of two means, and this is about relationship. I want to look at the relationship between quality of life and stress, and according to the re reference literature, we found that the R is zero point, I'm sorry, it's, I'm using the mouse, my mouse also has a problem, that's why I can't write properly, I apologize. So, this is 0 0.313. Can you can you do the sample size calculation for me? You have only one minute. Correct sample size, you will receive a free voucher of consultation one hour. Free of charge. This is a gift. Anybody who calculate the sample size correctly, I will provide one hour free consultation. <laughs> Omo, will you pay me or no? Later. Miss Omo is not here. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Twenty second. Hello, finish or not? Total of 64. Okay, let's me to calculate together. So, what should I do? I need to go to test, go to the correlation and regression. So then, Probably they are bivariate continuous data. You go to the bivariate normal distribution. Then again, according to the questions, I just want to test this relationship, but I did not mention about the direction, right? So that's why I need to use the two tail. The correlation coefficient was how much? 313. Three, three. Alpha is 5%, and then power is 80%. How much is the sample size? 77. So remember, correlation coefficient, it's an effect size. That's why you don't need to convert it. Yeah, when you want to test a relationship, right? Directly, you can apply the correlation coefficient as an effect size. So what I did here, and if I draw, this is the protocol. I copy this one, and if I want to draw the charts, this is the charts. The maximum sample size in order to detect this correlation will be around 120 something, correct? But I just look at the 80%, which is 71, 77. 
क्लियर एनी क्वेश्चन ओके सो सपोज दैट यू वॉन्ट टू कंपेयर यू वॉन्ट टू कंपेयर द डिफरेंसेज बिटवीन मले चाइनीज एंड इंडियन सो हाउ मेनी ग्रुप्स डू आई हैव थ्री ग्रुप्स इन ऑर्डर टू कंपेयर द मीन बिटवीन थ्री ग्रुप्स इफ यूर आउटकम यू गो टू द मीन्स इफ यू कैट हियर मेनी ग्रुप्स आनकोवा मेनी ग्रुप्स आनोवा सो इफ यू इफ यू अप्लाई आनोवा again you need to calculate the number of groups how many groups do i have three the power is 80% so as you can see here for anova we don't have directional or non directional hypotheses because it's multiple groups so that's why what you need to do only you need to define the effect size the effect size f is half of d remember the effect size of d This is the Cohen d, right? The Cohen d. If you want to calculate the f, because we have the f value also, the f is another measure for comparison of the effect size. So the f is equal to the half of d. So that's why the system already set by two five as a medium effect size. So once you calculate, look at here. If you click on the mean, then you can put the mean and size. and then you can calculate the what do you call it the standard deviation of error and then you can calculate the effect size based on the literature or maybe you compare 2 by 2 and the smallest effect size can be considered to be enter to the effect size f but remember this is not the d this is the f suppose that if you calculate this effect size based on this literature for example 99 0.99 you cannot enter 99 here you have to divide it by 2 why because f is half of d even if i go here look at here the effect size f my f is how much sorry d my my d is 0.99 it's equal to what 0.9495 as af so then in the g power I need to put that four nine five. Then calculate your sample size. How many samples do I need? Forty five for the total sample size. Okay, I think uh, we don't have too much time. There are some things that I want to mention, but remember, again, This workshop is just trying to introduce you the right way of sampling techniques and sample size calculation. Definitely, in the, the sample size calculation, as I mentioned earlier, it depends on the nature of your research hypothesis. Of course, followed by that, your statistical techniques. So that's why you need to define all the statistical tests and all the outcomes. suppose that you want to compare between malaysian and malay and non malay so and you have three different variables you have stress you have depression and you have anxiety you need to calculate the sample size for each of them separately and then take the highest number of sample this can be done for all the research objective so the number of sample size calculation depends on the number of objective and it depends on the number of the outcomes that you are measuring okay the last example that let me to give you another example for the correlation which is very common this is the regression sometimes you want to apply the regression analysis in regression analysis the effect size that we use is f square not f again it is f square so means you have to square the f f is how much here 495 if you square the f it will be calculator 0.495 square it will be 24 so now if i want to detect that effect size by using multiple regression 80% power and then 
This is very important. Number of predictors. When you run the linear regression or multiple linear regression, maybe you have some predictors or confounding factors or covariates. Suppose in this model, I have eight covariates and independent vectors. So then I calculate my sample size. So to detect that effect size, I need 71 subjects by eight predictors. If I increase the number of predictors, look at here, the number of sample size will be increased. If I reduce my effect size again, the sample size will be increased. If I increase my power, the sample size will be increased. Correct? Okay, so that's all for the G power. Let me to go back to my slides. Can you see my slide now? Yes. Good. So there is another software because actually the G power is free and easy to use, but the point is that the G power does not cover all statistical tests that may you need to apply. So in order to, uh, up, what do you call it, cover all the statistical tests, I advise you to go to the, another software which is called PASS. So if you search for PASS, it is it provides one month free trial. So if you search for PAS sample size, you go to this website, the latest version is 2021, and it, it's an amazing software. It covered, to be honest, I can say 90% of statistical tests. So all the statistical tests that you need, probably can, you can find it through this statistical softwares. Of course, it is a bit expensive, means if you want to buy it, <laughs> the price is around 2000 correct? Uh, for the personal use, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's around, uh, not for the network, it's, the range is between 1,000 to 2,000 US dollar, but of course, it is not rational to buy these softwares for a personal use. Uh, maybe you just use this free trial. The trial is here, correct? Or maybe... Uh, if you, even if you don't access, and if you, because in the free trial, if I'm not mistaken, they do not provide all statistical tests. They selectively, they uh, provide some statistical tests. But they don't worry. So if you want to calculate your sample size, For example, regression. So look at here. There are some other free open source softwares under R. R is a program, right? I don't know how many of you are familiar with R. R is an open source. R is an open source program that everybody can download it, but of course you need to know how to do the syntax. But recently, many people, they provided some packages like this package. Look at here, this is the sample size calculation with R. It's a bit difficult, a bit, not too much, but we need to spend more time how to calculate the sample size by R. They provided some packages, look at here. So this is uh, some packages that you can download and according to the statistical test, you can apply and run the power analysis to look at here. All these new techniques are based on the power. So for one sample, two samples, uh, even if you are searching for sample size calculation, for example, for a specific statistical test, you can apply uh, the R. R is open source, free of charge. But of course, you need to know how to use the R. But PASS is something like G power. You just select, it's based on some wizard menu, you can select and then you can calculate your sample size. Uh, but remember uh, one thing that I want to highlight before ending the session. What we calculate in terms of sample size is the minimum required sample size. Correct? Always we advise a researcher to collect more than that minimum sample size. 
because of the data cleaning, data management, uh, dropout rate, correct? So always we advise to add 10 to 20 percent. Depends on the nature of a study. For example, if you're running a longitudinal study, and if you assume that the dropout rate probably will be high, according to the literature, even you can multiply the sample size by two. So means 100% increment in the sample size. Just sharing with you one of my experience, we work on addicted people, correct? And the study was a longitudinal study. Initial sample size, for example, was 60-60. But since the subjects need to attend to the clinic over one year, and there is possibility of this group of subjects that can be arrested, you know, the, because of their situation, maybe they are not, uh, what do you call it, able to attend and fulfill the whole study, we multiply the samples by two. So means the initial sample size was 120, that we target at the starting point to collect more than 215 subjects because the dropout rate, iteration is high among this specific group of subjects. So that's why what you calculate in terms of sample size, remember, this is the minimum sample size. Okay. And the last thing is related to the cluster sample size. The cluster sample size, you need to also apply design effect. So the cluster sample size means you collect data based on group and clusters, especially when you do a cluster, uh, for example, random, randomized control trial for medical science, when you want to assign two groups, experimental and intervention. Suppose that you are going to run an experimental study among the students to avoid contamination, for example, effects in, RC, in, the, in experimental design, you assign one class for control, one, as one class, the whole class or a school for intervention. Since the students in within groups, they have some correlation among each themselves, then we need to increase and inflate the sample size by calculating another term criteria, which is called design effect. So the design effect actually is, an, is, a, is a coefficient that we can apply to increase our sample size. In order to calculate the design effect, you need to mention, you need to measure the amount of the variability within cluster divided by the total variability within and between cluster. So once you calculate the ICC, we call it ICC or interclass correlation. Once you calculate the interclass correlation, Correct? This can be done based on the pilot study or based on the literature. So once you calculate the ICC, then you need to calculate the design effect following this formula. So the ICC multiply cluster minus one plus one. Suppose that your ICC is 0 0.015 and you have eight cluster. For example, you have eight cluster. Four class you assign for intervention and four class among the students for the control. So total cluster is eight. So then you have to multiply this by eight minus one, which will be almost one zero five. Then plus by one means almost two. So means if your sample size in the normal situation is hundred, if you want to run it as a cluster sampling, then you have to multiply these samples by two. So it means you need to collect 200 samples. Correct? No matter this study is going to be uh, experimental study or survey. So if you go, for example, to this online calculator, open EP, especially for the epidemiological studies, if you go to the open EP website, In the sample size calculation for the proportion, if you look at here, the design effect for the complex sample. If you're running multi-state sampling, then you need to calculate the design effect. 
correct? So these are the issues that need to be considered. The design effect, usually we advise, uh, it should not be the, the range of the, what you call it, the design effect is between two to 10, depends on the outcome that is going to be studied. In the social science, they advise the ICC maximum can be 0 0.2 according to the sum of references. Correct? So, of course, there are a lot of things that I can cover, but that, that I can discuss, but now the time is almost finished, yes. There are many uh, statistical tests that you need to find the appropriate way to sample size calculation. For example, for those people who are from medical science, we have some sample size calculation like MedCalc, if you want to calculate the sample size for area under curve, sensitivity, specificity analysis, then you need to find the right sample size calculator based on the power analysis. Or even if you are doing the sample size for SEM, sample size calculation for the SEM, So this is another online sample size calculator for the structural equation modeling. Again, as you can see here, the point is that both alpha and beta should be there. But this sample size calculator for a structural equation modeling, of course, you need to identify the number of the latent variables, the number of observed or items, and then you can calculate it. So this is the formula, reference. This is one of the interesting websites. I just drop it in the chat box for those people probably are using the, the structural equation modeling. So for those people who apply the structural equation modeling PLS sample size, then sample size SEM PLS, then you can collect data sample size. Look at here in the research gate. This is the table. This table actually is based on the power analysis and depends on the number of the uh, exogenous variables or predictors at different level of significance, at different level of RA score as an effect size. So this is already calculated. But as long as it's based on the power, still you can report it. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you for your patience. And I'm sorry if there was any issue in the process of the presentation uh, shortage. <laughs> And uh, I hope that you enjoy from this topic and make sure that you need to continue, correct? So this talk webinar, try to introduce you the right way of sample size calculation and sampling techniques. Definitely, for further information related to your research, you need to investigate, you need to collaborate, you need to negotiate, contact experts and find some literature review, find other softwares, and make sure that your sample size calculation is based on the right way. Any question? If there is no questions, again, thank you very much and wish you all the best. Take care, stay safe during MCO and have a good day.